So now in this second part of today's lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about not so much image processing, but more about software engineering. Sounds to some of you maybe very geeky, unimportant, boring stuff, but it's actually something that is very relevant if you want to um, work with repeatable workflows uh, and making stable code that you can rely on doing the same thing every time. Um, and important items for doing this is one, working with unit tests. I'm going to explain all these things. Uh, two, working with repositories. And finally, also continuous integration. Now, I'm not saying you have to do everything uh, to 100%, but it's good at least to have this in mind when you write your code and work with it. Um, so first of all, unit testing is an approach that has been, yeah, I think it has been formalized during uh, this millennium. Before that, people wrote, of course, people always have been writing test code to see if you get the numerics right and so on, uh, that things are not crashing, trying new features, etc. But unit testing is a formalization of making tests and it's in, within a framework. So you really test different components, uh, smaller components of, of your code. Um, Unit testing is possibly in essentially every common programming language. So even some uh, programming language have built-in support for automatic testing and reporting. And um, there is actually a nice paper about the importance of doing these tests to avoid that you sh do changes that you think they are irrelevant to the rest of your code. But in the end, it could be that you make a change here in this part and over here in completely different part, maybe not even your own code, this crashes. And with the help of a unit test, you will see that it actually crashes. Because if you run the test after your uh, development, you, you run the test for the whole um, suite, then you see that, well, my unit tests, they work well, but the other guy's unit tests, they crash when I do like this. That gives you a hint that, okay, I did something that is not allowed. So the question is, should you change your code or should you, should you um, um, start working with the other guy uh, to adopt um, your changes so they also work? That, that is in, in the team, something you have to come up with and decide how to do it. Sometimes it's actually your own project, everything, and then you have to go responsible fully for, for the whole defect. Um, so when you do unit tests, in principle, the ideal from the software engineering point of view is that you write your unit test first. So it's kind of um, a requirement document this is what you expect your code to do. In practice, in many scientific projects, you write the tests after you have written your algorithm and code and so on. But still, it's good to have them there. Um, ideally, they, they should cover everything that you have in your code, but sometimes you can be less strict, but at least make sure that you have some testing available at least. Um, because if you have it, you can actually change, you can do a complete code revision in one piece and make sure that it works well and that it works well in the whole uh, system. Um, that is kind of a, a way to glue our system together in, in, um, in a teamwork or so. And what to test? One thing is you can test a happy path. That means testing to see that it does exactly what you want to do. So if you put in a one and you have a function that should com compute one plus one, um, you send in, oh, you have a code that says um, add 
uh, this uh, number to, to one. And then you run it through and you see, okay, it came out a two on the backside. Fine. Now you can go one step further. You have to make sure that um, you put in the right data type. So if you put in, uh, in this one plus one code, actually, I think that comes as an example a little bit later. Uh, but anyway, make sure that the data types also are right. And then we come to provoking your code. Maybe you have boundaries that are not allowed to be exceeded. It could be, for example, if you have some code doing something with two images, what happens if you give it two images with different sizes? Then you should have really, in, uh, for safe code, you should actually have tests making sure, okay, these two images are the same size. And the unit test would then test what happens if I put wrong images in. And then you will get some output, maybe you get an exception, or something. <clears throat> and the idea now is actually to send data that fails execution. So that's another way of uh, doing these tests. Um, the test data in numerical code, it's not so easy always to get all cases. And um, on one side, you can use um, experiment data for your testing. But then you need to have some reference what you would expect on the other side when it comes out. Uh, the other way would be to have simulated data. And then we come back again to our uh, testing um, validity and um, validation and test data. In principle, it's the same kind of data you need here. Um, and the unit. Um, the usefulness of this unit testing is only as good as you write your tests. So some people hate unit tests, or pretty many actually hate unit tests, because it seems like you write a lot more code for your tests than you write to, to solve your task. And that's kind of annoying in the beginning. But if you have a larger project, it actually will save you time in the, in the end that you have written all these tests. So we have um, different images uh, and here are a couple of examples. So we could have something like we have the test is an empty 2D image. That means empty would then in this case uh, mean that we have um, um, zero valued data. So we put in count voxels. And um, if we only have zeros, a zero matrix, then count voxels should be equal to, to zero. If it's true, test is okay, and you go on. If this count voxels on a zero image would give anything else, then this would give you a fail in your test suite. And you can see, and it actually tells you which test line it's uh, crashing on. Then we can test empty 3D. We give it a 3D volume here. And um, again, as it's a zero volume, again, you should expect a zero. The next, then we test diagonal 2D. That means we have ones in the diagonal and um, the other pixels or elements in this matrix are zero. So if you count the voxels now, it should give us a three. And if it does, we are happy. So these tests, they may seem very obvious, um, trivial, but it helps you actually to make sure that the code does what it's expected to. Then we can have uh, different, uh, then when you have in a larger system, you have your algorithm doing something. Uh, you have, uh, for example, this workflow where you have shape analysis, which contains a function component label, we have an image, and you have analyze object. And analyze object in such contains all these sub functions. And then you can write tests for each of these sub functions that you have in the image in, in this um, workflow and see um, what effect, uh, how well they work. And um, in Python, unit testing is 
so supported. So you have uh, this um, module called PyTest. And PyTest is good for larger projects. Maybe not if you have um, like one page um, screen page uh, of code, probably doesn't make so much sense. But still, you can make specific tests for each um, module you have. And um, then you can run these tests every time you update the project um, on your repository, for example. So in scikit image, we have um, some different, um, they actually use unit tests. And um, here we have um, test watershed. It's a class that is written. And um, then it's given some data in here and um, it gets some markers. So you can see that there is one marker here, one, and there is one marker here. So we, we should have minus one and one in, in this uh, segmented image, uh, in this watershed segmented image. And um, now we say we run the watershed and um, this is what we expect. So we actually provide what we expect on the outside, uh, output side. The error is computed as the difference between expected and out. And then we test if the error is less than some kind of epsilon. So that would be a, a test uh, run for, for a watershed, for example. Then we can um, do it also as piece of the documentation. So in, in Python, you can write so-called doc strings. That means that you can, with if you have these three um, exclamation marks in a row, that means that this is a doc string, and this doc string is something that you um, get on the screen. If you type help apply hyster hysteresis threshold, then you would get all this text. Um, the text here describes what the function does, and uh, it also tells what it should return. And here's an example below, and the example is actually the test code. So it is actually executed um, when you run the test. <clears throat> and um, yeah, well, here is the whole function. And uh, when we use this one, um, we need a little bit of help also in, in, in Jupyter. You can also do unit testing. For that, you need a little help function, something like auto test. And um, this auto test, you add that it's executed on, on the function. You define the line like this. You have auto test will be run. And then you have this doc string test, which says that add five and five should give us the result 10. And when you press shift uh, enter on this one, it not only defines the function, but it actually also executes the test. So now uh, it found a tech, uh, test in this function and it tries executing it. It expected 10 and um, yeah, it was okay. So this is good. If we now would say, uh, just play with it and say, we would expect nine instead. Then it would say, uh -uh, doesn't work. We expected nine and we got 10. So you can see here now how it really works in, in this. And also if you would say all of a sudden you change the code, um, for some reason, you also see that uh, this was also wrong. And then you know already that on line five um, in this function, there was something that went wrong. So you know, actually, so line five, that's this test, actually. And then on an image processing algorithm, we can also do it um, the same way. Uh, now we just have a simple label, which actually just calls the label function. So it's not very exciting as such. But uh, here we create first um, a diagonal matrix with three element, uh, three by three elements uh, and look at the test image. Should be like this. So we already test that the test data is right. 
Uh, then we run the simple label and um, we would expect, um, what's this? Um, all right, yeah. Um, and then we can see here that um, with this, we see look at test at image one one. That would be um, one one is this place. That's strange. Should be equal to. No no no. Sorry sorry sorry. Um, this is labeling, and um, then this is the expected output, and that's fine because we only have we have only a one segment here. Now, in the next test piece, we actually set the central element to be zero, and um, then we run the test again and see that we should get one and two in this labeling. And if we don't, so we, let's say we just would do something like this, um, then which would say done, yeah. It doesn't show. Okay. Um, but anyway, this test would fail. It's stupid that I can't get. Oops. So, yeah, now I can see it. Okay, good. So, if I would set, say that it should be 1 1, then it say, uh -uh, didn't work. I um, expected. That you should get a one one, but I got a one two. So this is a very simple test. Um, when you do algorithms, you probably have to do a little bit more elaborate tests to see if it works well. And uh, in these this kind of algorithms, you also have a lot of details to look at. Um, so for example, how the boundaries are handled, what happens if I do this, if I have to do that. And the more complicated the algorithms are, you probably do something like you have developed some prototype and um, you compare the results to this prototype and then you start working on that uh, as a reference. <clears throat> For example, if you would do um, code optimizations, you have one reference, which may be slow algorithm, and then you have a fast algorithm. And the goal is that the fast algorithm should do exactly as the reference algorithm. In MATLAB, you also have this unit test in C++ as well. And uh, now I come to this test-driven uh, programming, which is, say, the higher school. I don't think many of you will actually go in this direction unless you start working really as um, software developers. Uh, for the PhD or master project, this is kind of overkill, to be honest. But anyway, you can write, the idea is that you write the tests before the functional code, and you can use them as kind of the coded requirement document for the code you're writing. And if you have done it this way, you can even see uh, the test suite as a progress indicator. Because you see, okay, I have done this test. It works fine. Um, it turns out okay. I have done this um, test. Turns also out well. And then you can see how many tests you have failed and how many tests you have okay. So that gives you a, a good um, progress report on what you're doing. This requires a lot of um, planning and also uh, writing of requirement documents, etc. And Maybe it's not really the ideal thing you would do in, um, in a scientific project because you never know in, in advance exactly what you're going to code. But anyway, this is something that is done out there in, uh, in many uh, software development com um, um, companies or departments. So um, you have to look at... Um, exactly know what you want to do. So for example, shape analysis should give an anisotropy of zero when we bring in a sphere, could be one test. Um, we should um, get the center of the volume within a half a pixel position. Uh, we can also say that uh, the shape analysis must run um, 
1K, 1K image uh, within 30 seconds could also be a requirement. So uh, in this unit testing, you can even have benchmarking. This is a tricky uh, one because it depends on which computer you're running it on. If you are running it on your mini laptop, it may take two minutes, but that's fine for that computer. Or then you run it on a massive uh, workstation and it takes one second. So timing is something you can only test on the system that you're working on right now. Or you have to have a table for different uh, CPU types or different configurations, etc. So um, the testing is a good thing. It's actually very helpful. Anyway, you need to write small test codes anyway. Uh, why not do in them in, in the unit tests? The next thing that is very good for having the reproducible or repeatable um, workflows is using repositories. As you have seen, I'm using GitHub. Uh, this is um, actually a repository and very simple put, it's a backup system tailored for, use, for using in software development. The point with it is that it can synchronize different versions so if you're working in a team, you can actually, each team member can work locally on their code. And then at some point they bring it together and the system helps you to find the differences and um, merge it in, in a good way. Uh, the other thing is that you can also work with something called branches. So if you want to develop a new fancy algorithm, but you don't want to disturb the other people, then you can kind of take it into a separate room and work on your code until you're sure that it's actually doing what it should, and then you can go back. Um, another reason to use the repository is it makes it easier to go back to earlier versions. Um, as I already said, for reproducibility or repeatability, it's also a good thing. And if you all of a sudden your code have a bug. You can't avoid it. You will have a bug. Um, then it's much easier to go back and see where did this bug appear? Or actually, where did I change the code last time? And then you can go back in your repository and see the history. Ah, okay, it was here. And then you can compare the current version where you have a debug and the old version where it wasn't. And that makes it much easier to identify uh, the problems you had in your code. And of course, yeah, you can work in teams on the same code without interrupting each other with crashing code because your colleague did something stupid or you did something stupid and uh, bother your colleague. Uh, there are different repository frameworks. Right now, uh, Git is very popular for um, uh, open source development. So I would say it's the main uh, repository for that nowadays. Another one which is growing a lot in popularity is Azure, which is uh, Microsoft's own repository system. Um, it's very popular. You can see here the market share. This plot here is for Switzerland. Um, I would say if you look at any European country, you would see a similar um, development. Worldwide, it looks a bit different because there is a lot of old legacy systems on different places. So um, other ones that were very popular uh, are, were Subversion or CVS, but CVS is almost down to zero in, uh, in Europe. Subversion, actually some reason it didn't appear in this plot, but it's, Something similar, it goes, makes a bump about here, and then Git took over completely. <clears throat> and Git is also available in um, open in, in servers, in services that you can just log into. And there are different uh, Git servers. You can even actually you can even set up your own Git server if you like. And um, what it does, it's not only having they're providing repository, this database function, but often you can also have issue tracking involved. So if 
you can more or less make small, small cards with tasks or reporting bugs. And on top of that, you can also work with project management. So if you have some timelines you need to do and you have this 150 item issue list, uh, you can prioritize and say, okay, right now I want to work on a selection. And then you can put it in something called a Kanban table where you have on one side tasks to do, active tasks, and in the other side, you have tasks, tasks finished. And then you can see also the project uh, progress in this. There are many public Git servers already uh, on the market. Um, they are, I would say, semi-free. Uh, that means you can always, for open source projects, you can always open up a repository, a repository project uh, on GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and places like that. Then there are also um, more advanced things like GitHub. I think in the free version, you don't have private uh, repositories. So everything is really open. In for academia, um, people uh, working at uh, universities, students, you can get um, GitHub for academia, which means you actually have this uh, possibility of doing um, private uh, repositories too. If you don't want to trust all these um, uh, big companies, um, so for example, GitHub, I think is nowadays owned by Microsoft. Um, GitLab is owned by a company called Atlassian. Uh, if you don't want to put your code on someone else's server, uh, you can also, for example, at ETH, um, there is this GitLab where you can submit your code. I think you just can you can just use your normal login and uh, then you can put your da data there. GitLab also have some as an issue tracking, I would say it has. I actually haven't looked at uh, GitLab at ETH, what they provide, but usually this kind of service has the basic issue tracking and sometimes also the project management part. So the workflow is you can work on a single branch, then everybody are writing code, then it would look like in principle, like a backup server with comments. Um, what I recommend to do is to work with branches because then you always have a main branch, which is supposed to be working. And then you have branches for every sub task you are doing. So if you just want to change a single line, maybe it doesn't make so much sense to create a branch, but if you want to add a new piece of functionality or you want to do some debugging of a code, then it makes sense to uh, create a branch and then do something. You can see here, this yellow line here says I um, did something and then I did a couple of commits. So this is sending in information to, uh, to the server and uh, did a couple of commits. Then when I'm done, I go down here, uh, I go to this point where I say, okay, now I want to bring in what is in the main branch because your colleagues may have changed something and then you want to bring that in. Um, you merge them, make sure that it runs again. And then finally you do something called a pull request where you bring it back into the main line again. And then your fixed bug is included in, in the main code again. And um, this can you can even do branch sub branches within branches. I tend to do only single <clears throat> uh, single branching because then otherwise it gets really confusing. Uh, okay, this one should that is for the notes. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about now is uh, continuous integration. Uh, that's actually a framework, an automatic server that um, brings you the combination of unit tests, um, compilation, a compilation 
unit tests and combining that with, with repositories. And um, the idea is you say, I have my repository. I tell the um, integration server, please, when I do a push to the main branch, please build. And then it actually builds your whole code and runs the unit tests. And then afterwards, it gives you some reporting. So like you can see here, uh, it's some, um, this particular um, push uh, turned out well in the, in the unit test, great. And we can also see a little bit how long it ran. Currently, um, I actually also use um, this um, service. Um, the server I'm using is called Travis. Travis CI. Um, I'm actually using it also for uh, testing my um, lecture notes. Right now I have a configuration problem, so um, it doesn't recognize some things. So it doesn't really run through and build the latest version of, um, of the notes. And that has been lagging a little bit in, um, in my preparations. That's why also not always that uh, my um, lecture notes have, have come up in time. But now I do it, uh, currently I do it manually. And then at some point I have to fix uh, my, my build server so it does what it's supposed to. Uh, but anyway, it's a quick, uh, it's, you don't have to do anything. Once you have set it up, it actually does everything in the background and then you get an email, worked, didn't work. And um, then you get, get the feedback without even thinking about it. You can also have these uh, small badges uh, that um, you can put on your repository um, to show that the current version of the main branch is running and it's fine. So it's, it's a very useful uh, tool. And also this is something that is semi-free again. Um, right now I'm actually running um, on Travis and it is free, but there are some indications that they may actually charge you for, for this service at some point. Um, let's see what the future has in, in mind. But right now for open source projects, you can use it for free. If you have larger projects um, or want more resources, uh, because you're actually using someone else's computer when you do this. So if you want uh, larger projects, maybe faster builds, then you may, or building on different operating systems, you may have to pay something. But if for the basic functionality, this is already a good step. And <clears throat> with that, I'm actually at the end of today's lecture. It wasn't so long today. Um, so what I've been talking about is working with multiple modalities, um, how we can use information for different, um, uh, from different modalities in order to get more information about your sample, which is in the end, the goal that we want to do better quantifications out of the data. Um, you can add it as a component in analysis and in visualization, or actually both. And then you can also do diffusion on different levels of abstraction. And um, then you can also decide if you want to only do the visualization or if you want to do some segmentation. So I mentioned a new thing uh, with the Gaussian mixture models. Software engineering is something that is very useful um, for supporting the um, repeatability in your code. And also when you're working in teams, it seems like a lot of extra work to do it. And yes, it is quite some additional learning to do, but in the end, once you, if you take this step, you will probably appreciate it uh, later. In the beginning, it's a lot of work, but I recommend working with it if you start writing more code than just small recipes to go through your little uh, analysis. So that was all for today. Um, I will stay around uh, if anyone wants to ask questions regarding exercises or projects. Um, yeah, I'm away. Um, I will be available until uh, noon today. So thank you for today. <laughs>